I'm going to start off with uh, just a question to all of you. We've started this school year and as we reflect, we know that it's been quite a time for reasons we don't need to repeat. But the last time our year sixes had a normal school year, they were in year three. The last time our year threes had a normal year, they were in reception. So there's been, uh, you know, apart from everything that's happened, whatever's happened has gone on over a long period of time. And we come back to this academic year with a lot of hope for some more normality, but it's questionable how that plays out in reality. And I guess I'm interested, Hilary, to maybe start with you and hear what are the issues that, that I mean, perhaps there have been no issues, but what are you hearing about well-being, good, bad or otherwise, uh, in the profession uh, at the moment, at this point in the year? So since we've come back, um, I guess we, what we're trying to do is all get used to a new kind of normal. So we had the new kind of normal in COVID. Now we've come back. Uh, and bubbles have stopped and all that kind of stuff. We're getting used to a new normal again and everyone is just shattered <laughs> because we are, you know, trying to think what do we used to do when we go swimming? Um, lots of staff are poorly, their immune systems are extremely low. We've got lots of staff off with coughs, colds, chest infections, throat infections, some staff off with COVID, so that then everybody else is impacted because we've got a shortage. And we're just all shattered, aren't we? Pins are absolutely shattered. Um, but a lot of that is mentally drained. Um, you know, there's the physical side of things, but the mental sort of drainage is, it's always busy in school, September, October, isn't it? It's one of our busiest times, but this is something completely different. It's on a different level. That's uh, Bupinder, I'm going to come back to you in a minute, but I just want to bring Cully in. We're seeing very much similar pictures there. I think that the key thing is here that it's a new norm for all, and that's for all stakeholders, not just us staff. But um, you have this certain angst or anxiety from parents and carers who are not concerned as such, but just want to be reassured about what it is that their children are walking back into. Staff feel, of course, that has COVID gone away because it looks that way because we're now out of bubbles. So, and, and sometimes I think what we find is some staff are feeling that they're, they're not okay to ask questions because the question could be silly, but it's not silly, of course, and no question can be silly as we're trying to adjust to new normals. Um, and some staff have also raised that it feels that the job is done, that suddenly we are now back and, and it is back to normal. And what we've, we've got to remind ourselves is that um, as we readjust to what it was that we do, and we, we come out of this in this sort of hybrid model, whatever that looks like, we've got to make sure that we're talking with all stakeholders at all times to, to, to show that everybody's involved in this process. The danger, I think, is that when if we as leaders or um, leaders at all levels seem to say that this is our new normal and take no input from any of our stakeholders, it will take a lot longer to, to get used to. So it's about engagement now moving forward, about what's working um, and what improvements do we think we need from all of us being involved. So that's the picture in the secondary sector, I think. Thanks, Cully. Bupinder, from the, the, the perspective of a year three teacher, in the middle of the class with exactly those students who haven't been in since they were at the very beginning of their school career. How is it from your point of view? I just think it's quite overwhelming. I think that's not just from a year three teacher's point of view, I think it's from like any class teacher. Um, I think it's quite overwhelming because we're like Hilary had mentioned and Crilly had mentioned that we're going back to the old normal and we just about adjusted to the COVID way and out with a staggered start time, the finish times, the break times, the bubbles. And, you know, assembly was done in your classrooms or over teams. It was, you know, it's, everything was virtual. Um, we haven't seen other colleagues in the buildings. We weren't allowed to go and mix with them. Um, and I think one of the biggest things is, is trying to fill those gaps in pupils learning. You know, we're trying to catch up and get them to where they should be but we need to actually kind of be, you know, thoughtful to ourselves and say, actually, they've missed out because of a pandemic, a global pandemic that has hit every single person. Um, and, you know, that's what we need to kind of sit back and think. We're, we're doing absolutely fine. We're doing the most we can, you know, trying to fill those gaps, trying to close those gaps in their learning. There's a lot going on there. And of course, the term catch up has has acquired its own weightiness uh, and, and means different things to different people. 
Um, I'm, I'm interested to hear uh, what the picture is like, Becky, from your perspective. So you're in HR, obviously as administrator, support staff often can be overlooked in these conversations about what's happening in, in schools. And I'm just interested from that perspective, what would you describe? How, what are the issues that, that you would recognise? I think um, the same as teaching staff, support staff have still got those anxieties, um, especially our uh, learning support who are dealing with our most vulnerable students who are still going through those anxieties. They're still concerned. They're still worried. So their, their focus is trying to support our students as well as themselves. From a HR point of view, we're still doing the clean up from those who've had personal losses due to COVID. And also those who suffered um, from the isolation period, some have come back with imposter syndrome, some have come back with depression, and it's about rebuilding them as well. We are very oriented to, to, to move to what Bupinda was describing with catch up and so on. And of course, people's lives have changed unrecognizably in this period, either for losses that they've experienced or the effect of living through the pandemic and what that's meant. So it's really timely, I think, to let ourselves remember that in, in all of the conversation about normality. Um, Nikki, with that in mind, you are a counsellor and of course you're working with children and young people and working with staff in a school setting. When you look out from this point in the term, what are you seeing around? What are you noticing? Staff, it's really important. I think that's been brought out already to think there's their personal world and there's their professional world. And both have been completely rocked in the last couple of years. Um, and there's those anxieties from both aspects are sort of coming up this term in school. Any difficulties they brought, they're bringing back into school from their personal lives, from anything that's happened to them personally during, during lockdowns, any family ang health anxieties, any of their own health anxieties. We've had quite a lot of COVID still in Bristol, so there's definitely anxieties about infection. Um, I think also academically, there's now concerns we're back in. There's a, there's a feeling maybe things are over and it's the new normal and we're back on the academic machine, the treadmill. How are we going to catch up for lost time for teachers? That's a lot to be holding in mind. And then there's things like the, the connection in the staff body where the, where the allies were, where the friendships were, where the groups were. Over 18 months, two years, people have left, people have started. There haven't been staff room activities, there haven't been a lot of social events. Um, how isolated are members of staff feeling now compared to earlier when they might have had their tight groups or their support groups? structures in place professionally. That's such an interesting point that you make because of course part of any what, what's going on in any school is the relationship across that group and the group dynamic mm -hmm. and people have come and gone as you say and people have been affected differently so there is a lack of familiarity in that way as well. For, for long periods of time people have been disconnected not you know because that's what the situation required but coming back and finding that those relationships aren't what you knew and could rely on and actually having to remake them, I think is, is really, it's very, very easy to not recognize that that is a, something that needs attention um, and ultimately can be a great source of support, but does require time and investment too. Absolutely. And Bupinda said, you know, the staff haven't been, been able to talk to each other because we've had the two meter distancing for so long. And they haven't been able to support each other for a long time. And, and, and it has occurred to me that actually what probably has happened is that everyone's come back and got on with the job. And well-being actually may well have gone to the back burner personally for a lot of people. Maybe when they've, you know, well-being was it certainly came sharply into focus during lockdown. I think there was a lot more well-being, welfare calls home and things and looking out for staff. And maybe now, actually, as staff members ourselves, we've forgotten about our own well-being. And I do think half term is really well positioned now for people to just take a breath and think, gosh, what do I do? That's a really uh, important point, Nikki, I think that you're making there. Um, I'm just I'm going to uh, 
turn our attention and ask the panel just about how in practice then, with all of that going on personally and professionally and for children and young people, how, what are the strategies we can use to be bringing well-being and personal mental health and well-being to the forefront of the agenda? What's, what works? What's, what's useful um, in that? But just before I turn to, to the panel to ask that, and I probably will start with you, Cully, in a second, um, I want to just remind participants in the event, we're delighted to have questions here. Um, uh, so if you would like to use the chat function and list your question, I'll then pick them up and, and ask them to the panel. So feel free to, to add, you know, if there's stuff that you want to know and you want the agenda to turn to, we're very happy to address the issues that are meaningful for you in, in, in the audience. So, so please you do use that. So Cully, in terms of, of actually trying to then in a meaningful way, bring and keep, I think the sustaining thing is important, the point that Nikki makes, but sustaining a focus on, on well-being for staff. What are the strategies that, that we can use and what's useful in trying to do that? Wellbeing is responsibility of all of us and it must be at all levels. So what we've done here at, at Bristol Hall Academy is we've made sure that simple things, and sometimes it's a case of you've got to be careful that things don't fall into the tokenistic sort of uh, branding, so to speak. So you look after them, a simple hello and how are you? Sometimes somebody might think, well, I've done my job there. But if you really want to sustain this in academies, we need to make sure that things such as our line management meetings, um, feature well-being at the top of the agenda, not at the, at the end. Uh, just as sort of an afterthought, when often your meetings are kind of running out of time, we should be talking about those things very much right at the start, straight after there are any matters arising. We've also made it a feature here to, as part of our SLT meeting, so we discussed that about what strategies can be can be thought of moving forward. We we encourage our middle leaders and our leads within our support staff to check in with all staff too during their area time or their uh, professional development time, their PD time, to make sure it's discussed. So it's about increasing the channels of communication really, and not just waiting until a survey comes out once a term, because let's just check on the staff because we haven't done that for a while. That's truly the way that strategically you, you make sure it stays on the agenda. Let's not forget as well that, that there was a pressure certainly on staff when we went into that second lockdown, that sort of second official lockdown, where staff were, everything was ramped up, wasn't it? That everybody had to be working from home, everything had to be live, it became by law something that they had to do. But those things, just because we're now back at face to face, don't, don't, doesn't mean that they have to stop. And it might not be the calls home now, but you're now seeing them face to face. And that's why having them as agenda items, having things recorded, making sure then that if there is something to follow up, that then that's communicated with the relevant well-being champions that we have here in the academy. It makes sure that nobody goes unseen. And that's the same for students. Students are aware that they can approach their mental health and well-being champions here in the, in the academy. And let's not also forget about our parents and carers. Our parents and carers have certainly struggled at home uh, alongside us in the teaching sector. They became another recruitment to our workforce, really, working with, with our children. And many things came to light. And those phone calls home have continued here at the academy. Uh, those kit calls, those keeping in touch calls, just to check if everything is still OK. And sometimes it can be signed off, so to speak. But sometimes it, it's that professional, but also personal touch that those stakeholders need to. So let's get it agenda right and um, let's get make sure that we are talking at all levels. Let's make sure it's it's on the agenda for all people who can make a significant change. And let's not just have one person responsible for it. Let's be talking about it um, right the way through the core of the academies and schools that we work in. Thanks, Cully. And Hilary, just, just listening to Cully there, I can hear the theme of relationships being so core to that, those connections that we have with all the different members of the community. When, when you're thinking about sustaining a focus on, on staff, mental health and well-being, what do you think, from your perspective, what are the things that are most important, most useful and most practical, actually, in that? What Cully was saying about um, just talking about it, putting it on the agenda, I mean, being very open and honest, I'm, you know, principal at school, but I'm very open and honest. I've had four lots of counselling for, for different reasons over my lifetime. And I think the more people can be open about that, it actually then gives other people um, sort of the chance to think, oh, actually, I, you know, it, it's not a stigma to it. Um, so it's, it's talking about it. And it's also putting on your own oxygen mask, whether you're a leader, whether you're a teacher and dealing with children or a counsellor dealing with children's mental health, 
or a leader dealing with other people, a well-being champion. You need to look after yourself first because, um, you know, the, listening to people, I, I can sometimes take on people's problems on my shoulders and I'm, I'm getting a little bit better at it. But it can be, I take things to heart, you know, I'm, I'm a fixer, I try to solve everyone's problems and you can't. All we can do is listen, pay attention, give that person full attention um, and signpost and, and encourage. I mean, I always say that, you know, don't don't wait to the point where you feel, feel you need the counselling because I'll, I'll have people say, I'm not, I don't need it yet. I'm not ready yet. I'm not that bad yet. Well, don't wait for yet to come. Seek help now. I mean, the, the new website's amazing. I've checked that out. Um, seek help. Talk to someone, whether that's a friend or, or um, you know, a family or whether it's a professional. Just talk because um, it really does help. And um, I know Pinder's going to talk a little bit more about um, some of like, the things we do. And it isn't tokenistic because some of the things we do in school are to make staff feel valued. Just like we would with children in our class, we try to make them feel valued. We, you know, that's very important for adults too. So, hope I've answered that bit of the question. Tonight. Yeah, you have, Hilary. Bapinder, do you want to do you want to tell us a little bit more? Yeah. So, going based on what Hilary just said about feeling valued and appreciated, I think that is like the centre of you know your staff. They want to feel valued. They want to feel appreciated. And um, you know, we do some of the things that can't, some of the things that we do at Calm, sorry, are we've got positive affirmations in the toilet. And I remember I put them up and Hillary was at a training all day that day. She came the next day and she was like, who's put those in the toilet? Should I just stood there and washed my hands and I thought, well, I am brave. I'm confident. I can do this. But, you know, and it kind of just does, just does little things can just uplift you. Um, and make you think, actually, I'm here for a reason. I'm, I shouldn't forget what I'm here for. Um, and I think we also did um, Hello Yellow Cups last week for World Mental Health Day. It was like a cup of goodness, and it just had just a disposable coffee cup with a hot chocolate, a lemon slice, yellow ribbon, and a positive affirmation um, little card, something like this. I don't know if you can see that or not. But it's just got a little positive affirmation you know, to say that we are not a team because we work together. We are a team because we respect, trust and care for each other. And it's just those little things that can actually just, you know, do a world of goodness, you know, for someone who is maybe coming in and just thinking, oh, I feel a bit missed today. You know, that those sort of things. And we have Wellbeing Wednesday emails sent out every Wednesday with a nice motivational quote um, and just reminding people that we're all here, we're all in the same boat, and that you can always come and speak to a wellbeing champion or a member of SRT if you feel you need to. Um, we also, in the summer term, we spent an afternoon of our inset of just pure wellbeing activities, karaoke, dance, reading groups, uh, baking. So just doing those things just to make your staff feel like they are appreciated and they are valued went down really well yeah yeah so we like staff gave us really positive feedback and said thank you we you know we enjoyed it and um, we bonded again with each other and i think it was nikki was saying about those relationships have been disconnected so that gave us an opportunity to come to any small groups yeah. away from each other to some extent but coming back together they, they signed up for um, an activity that they enjoyed um, um it was all led by staff yeah. members and everyone we laughed we laughed <laughs> and that you know if you can laugh together as a team that's really bonding you isn't it and making people feel valued it's, it's very um i mean it's real it's a horses for courses isn't it you know i i can imagine my team if we suggested karaoke and they were forced to listen to any of my saying they would suggest that's probably not <laughs> ideal for their well-being i'm pretty confident but that, that point about different teams will respond to different activities. Um, and I know we've got a, 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 a question from Tina around what happens when people are too busy, they feel too busy to get involved and how do you tempt them back? I'm gonna ask you to have a think about that and I'll come back to that shortly. But, but Becky, I'm really interested from your perspective, what do you think, so we're talking a little bit about what, what we can do in, as, as, as schools and school leaders, but also, of course, as teachers and staff ourselves, anybody working in school, we can, there are some things that we can do to look to support ourselves. And I'm really curious about 
you know, anything that you've seen or observed and any thoughts that you have on that? I think one of the biggest things for me that came out of COVID is we've moved to a more virtual world. So even if the, we're not getting together, there is that, you know, we can access through there. Um, I've um, attended a TNG on wellbeing this afternoon with people across our whole academy where we've discussed strategies and shared ideas. And some of the ideas that have just been um, discussed by um, Hilary Bapinda came up as well. Um, so that's, it's one of those where we can still communicate um, with each other. And I think that's one of the biggest things. As a HR rep, we're, we have our employee support programme, we have counselling. We're also launching training for our staff in-house um, to become for mental health first aiders so that they can support each other within. And also we were launching our wraparound care so that people in the academy can highlight what what makes their mental health so far, what, what their um, line manager can see when it starts hitting um, danger points so that we can stop that before it gets to breaking point. I think the biggest thing for me is communication at um, the both academies where I work. We've got mental health ambassadors who's always there to speak. Myself, my office is always open to talk to people. And I think that's one of the biggest starts to try and get people back. And people should be able to open up to others and speak openly. Nikki, if you had a magic wand and could invite every member of the staff team to do certain things to look after their own well-being, what would you be waving that wand to achieve? What would you be wanting them to do? Just stop and just think about yourself and get in touch with yourself and listen to yourself and give yourself permission to stop. People who work in schools work 24-7. They're just non-stop. Even in the holidays, they're plotting and planning the next term or... It's, um, I think it's, it's really important to give yourself permission to stop. Yeah. Um, and then listen to yourself. What, what's not okay? What is okay? Lots more of that, please. What's not okay? Um, can you do anything about it? Do you need to do anything about it? Do you need to just notice it's not okay? But, or do you actually need to chat that through and think of some strategies for that? Do you need yeah. to alert someone to that? Do you need to just change your lifestyle a bit? Have a, have a good thing. Prioritise yourself. Again, people who work in schools, they prioritise other people, <laughs> young people, colleagues, parents. As, as Chloe said, there's loads of stakeholders to, to work with. But also, genuinely, the majority of people who work in school are, are, are people people. And they, they want to help people. So that's all that you're giving out all the time. And as Hillary says, you know, put your oxygen on. And, I, you know, if... if during term time, that is incredibly difficult, but still give yourself permission to stop and, and have a think about how, how are you? There's, I, I love that your first piece of advice is to stop. You know, there, there's a, I get myself in a bit of bother trying to explain this sometimes, but um, everything I've understood tells me that the opposite of working isn't not working. You can be, and I work with so many people in school settings who are not working, you know, technically, but their heads are full of the stuff from work. They're thinking about that child who, uh, you know, doesn't seem to be okay. They're worrying about the parents who've come in to talk to them about something that's quite distressing. It's constantly going around in their head. And so, you know, when people say, well, I'm not, I'm not actually working, you think, well, that isn't quite enough. It seems to me that that requirement for rest and recovery requires us to actively go out and find things to do in which we can become completely absorbed. Because when we're, when we're absorbed in something else, we're no longer, allowed, you know, we don't have the brain space to be fretting or worrying or going around in, you know, around in circles about stuff or, or simply just dealing with, you know, an incredibly long list of things that want to be done. Uh, so I, I love that you, Nikki, highlight their stopping as, as a really important uh, piece of advice. And Kali, to Tina's point, when people say they're too busy to engage in stuff that might be about trying to support them or support the wider staff group, how, what can we be doing? What's, what's needed in schools to kind of try and shift that and encourage people to take a little bit of time to participate? I think it's a fantastic question from Tina. And I think it goes back to the point I made earlier, which is 
well-being cannot be one person's job. And if we're talking about well-being at all levels, we need to be knocking the doors of the senior leadership team in, in Tina's school and saying, we have to get this right. The, the SLT has to have the buy-in. If there's an, if, if SLT is saying there, I was reading the chat there, saying everything's back to normal, that's where things will break down. It becomes an us and them, doesn't it, really? Um, I am the wellbeing champion, and one of them, shall I say, um, as principal, and, and I work closely with Becky, uh, who's already spoken, and Gemma Morris, I can see in the chat, and across Academy Transformation Trust, we've made it clear that these wellbeing champions should be across a range of roles. These aren't, there's no hierarchy in this. This is, it should be an open door policy and we should be transparent. And what I'd say there as well is if, if SLT aren't listening, let's go back to the Ofsted criteria. If that's all they're thinking about, and of course, progress is what we want, we want children to achieve, we want staff to be happy. Let's look at the outstanding criteria, which talks about staff workload and staff well-being. There's a section in that criteria which says that leaders have to take account for that too. So if, the, if that's not being done, I think there's a there's a moral obligation, but also let's just remind ourselves if you're chasing something such as the Ofsted good or outstanding, it's in that criteria too. So just a reminder to those SLT members, and I'm sorry if those SLT members are on this group and on this call, but some we have, you must make sure that wellbeing champions are more than just the Tinas out there. Tina needs support, and that's why it works well here at Bristol Hall because we've got a you know a plethora of them, and they're across every single level. And we've even got student wellbeing ambassadors, so that means it's talked about at every level. We haven't quite got parent wellbeing um, ambassadors yet, but we're working on it. That's brilliant, Cully, thank you. And, and for the poor maligned members of SLT whose name is being taken in vain through the conversation, and always is, um, I think it's, we also need to remember that, um, you know, our SLTs have been under the cosh in a way that they never have before. Um, and sometimes people are resistant to prioritizing this because they don't think it's worth prioritizing. Increasingly, what I find in my work is it's not that, it's that it's one of two other things. Either those members of SLT don't have the skills, they don't quite know how to do it, and they don't have the support and encouragement from elsewhere to do it, because they too need that kind of development. Or more frequently again, they are stressed and strained, and none of us operate terribly well when we're under stress. So we might know what the right thing to do is, but we don't always manage to do it. So I think there's a bit of um, needing to come at that a bit more broadly and trying to get a whole school um, approach is probably better because if we can make the connection between the well-being of our staff and the well-being of our students, that is more compelling. And as Cully says, there's a real clear link to the sort of accountability measures that may be sitting very heavily on the shoulders of, of some of the um, the SLT. I'm loving uh, in, the, in the chat seeing some of the book titles come up in response to Rachel's question. Rachel, my colleagues at Ed Support will also post a link to, we, we've published about 50 new resources on our website in the last month. And so somebody will put a link to that up as well. But colleagues who are on the call, any resources that you want to share, please do in the chat function. We'd be delighted to see them. Um, Becky, I'm going to come to you and then I'm going to go back to Bupinda and, and, and Hillary and then and then uh, and then come to Nikki. I'm really curious when you are out there having conversations about well-being and about mental health. Are there things that you see people doing that you think, oh, no, please don't do that. Or this is really not helping. This is going to make things worse or more difficult. Are there any pitfalls? around this topic of well-being that you think we we ought to be mindful of avoiding i truly think that mental health and well-being is a more open subject now it is getting better over the years it can still be um, seen as stigmatic and i do find that some people who you can truly see are struggling are still coming forward as saying i don't want to look weak I don't want to look, um, I don't want to be like burden you. I'm sorry for how I'm reacting. And I think it's about breaking that cycle. It's about saying that that it's nothing to be embarrassed about. We all have we all have mental health. Sometimes it's good, sometimes it's bad, and it's about breaking that stigma of it. Um I also think that when you are having those conversations with people, it's not always helpful to direct them and say you should do this and you should get better and you're going to be doing this and when I went through it I did this it's more about asking those open questions to get them to get round to where they need to be so 
So what made you feel like this? Do you think that this would help? What do you think is going to help you get, get better? What do you think we as an academy can support you so that they can get to that realisation of what they need rather than us telling them? Not telling people what they should do is a tremendous piece of advice. I think actually in life in general and not just for matters of well-being and, and uh, mental health, it's uh, it's it's really helpful to tell other people what they ought to do. Um, so the idea of inquiring into what somebody themselves knows, because often we do know, actually, we do really know what would be good for us. We just, for whatever reason, aren't in a position to make that choice in that moment. But having the conversation with another person can remind us that, that, that we do have some wisdom on this and we do have some options open. Um, Hilary and Bupinder, I'm really interested in, in what you think are the pitfalls to be avoided, the goodness me, please don't ever do this moments that you might have. I know you won't have seen these in your own school, obviously, but you may have heard of other people doing things that should never be done. And I'm really interested to hear about that. Anonymously, of course. I don't know. I suppose from my point of view, I have to sort of make sure I listen better. I'm a talker. I talk a lot. And sometimes I do try and relate my own experiences to that memory of staff to try and make them feel better. But sometimes I have to say to myself, it's not about me. Stop talking about yourself, Hilary. Listen. And, and Nikki said, stop. I have to say that to myself. Stop and listen more. So not talk too much. Because if you're talking all the time, that person who might have really, really... Um, you know, it might be a brave step for them to knock on your door to say, I'm struggling. If I then do all the talking, it, that my moment might be lost. So I, I'm having to say to myself all the time, listen better, be a better listener. Yes, you can relate it because sometimes it's you relate it, to yourself, it makes it feel less um, like they're the only one because it can be very isolating mental health. You know, if, if you do have it at the moment going through um sort of negative feelings you can feel extremely isolated like you're the only one that feels like this so the first thing i do say is it's very common it's extremely common to feel like this um and then what i try and do is just try and stop talking which i'm going to do now and see if <laughs> Pinder wants to say anything <laughs> um i i always think um the best thing for well-being is to work in a place that's quite supportive um, and reflective and having that sort of culture and that sort of environment it helps it's you know every every day is a learning curve you know we teach our children um, and at the minute our focus in, in our academy is a high challenge and a low threat and I just feel like that is perfect to for members of staff is you know make your your workplace and environment where there's a high challenge there's challenges available it's there for you but if you get it wrong you make a mistake it's fine it's okay it's not a problem we can learn from it we can improve we can you know don't worry about it and it shouldn't have that feeling of oh my goodness what is going to happen and i'm too scared to admit that i've made a mistake and i don't know what the repercussions are going to be um so i just think having that supportive that reflective environment that workplace culture is what we need and it's what we teach the children so I think it'd be silly if we don't teach ourselves that. The way we speak to ourselves you would never speak to another person like that you wouldn't speak to another colleague or a best friend or anybody like that but sometimes negative self-talk can really really take over so just trying to be kinder to ourselves you know your inner voice is such a negative thing sometimes, particularly in a school, I haven't done this, I haven't had a chance to do that, I haven't spoken to so-and-so, it's my fault, but that went wrong. And trying to actually, that's why actually when you go and look in the mirror and see something that says, I am kind, I am brave, it just reminds me, actually, we're all just trying our best, aren't we? We're just trying our very, very best, but we're all human beings. I love the um, the attention to 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 listening, you know, to not needing to say so much, not needing to fix it. I think it's a very easy, it's very easy for us to get into that. And actually, particularly for the leaders in the room, whatever level of leadership you're at, it's very easy to feel like you need to fix something um, and much more difficult to pause and to listen, but fantastic to um, 
to, to be reminded of that. And actually the other thing in what you were describing, Hillary, was, was affirmation. You know, when you say to somebody, it's very common, making people, you don't need to fix it, but you can acknowledge with people that how they, how they feel is really legitimate. Um, and they need not have any shame or concern about, about sharing that. You know, what we do, obviously there's a range of things. If, if I'm feeling very angry, there's a range of behaviors, no more than with kids that could be deeply inappropriate, but the feeling itself is, is completely legitimate and, and reminding people of that, I think can be very powerful too. N Nikki, you're obviously, you know, seeing um, children, young people, as well as staff. And I suppose seeing how a range of people do and don't address well-being. Are you? Are there any pitfalls you've seen where you think, yeah, people have tried this, and actually, I wish they wouldn't. It's not very helpful. I think that one size fits all doesn't help. I think we have to recognise difference, massive difference, all difference when we're when we're working with um feelings. We can have similar similar experiences to other people, but we will all respond very differently to them, and um and that's really important to remember. So you know, I think Hillary was recognizing if if she says talks about herself, then that that stops people telling perhaps their story because they might feel all oh, oh, my story is different to hers, and maybe I shouldn't say it because maybe it's not right. All my feelings are different. So, so really understanding that that feelings and reactions are individual and unique, and 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 expect individual and unique reactions when you ask people how they are. Um, um, I think it's really important. I really like the idea that Kelly said that there's no hierarchy in well-being. Well, there shouldn't be any hierarchy in well-being. Um, that's that's really important. It's it's the same for all of us. Sometimes we feel okay, and sometimes we don't. Everyone, every human. I really, really like that. I'm going to come around to all of you on the panel and just ask you for some really practical advice whether it's for staff, whether it's for school leaders, whether it's for individuals, whomever they are. I'm really curious to know what your kind of really, um, your nugget of wisdom is that you would want people to take away. Uh, and it might be something you've tried. And just from my own perspective, practically, something that I've found to be really powerful um, through the, the kind of the summer and coming into the autumn was, talking to our own leadership team at Education Support who'd been flat out doing all the things they do um, and recognizing that there was quite a lot of strain in the team. We had a conversation as a group and decided, um, I invited, basically invited the team to come down into third gear. That was the expression that we used, that we would take a month of trying to come down into third gear instead of staying in fifth or sixth gear the whole time, because looking around and, you know, I could just see that wasn't going to be sustainable. We couldn't come out of one academic year in that mode and go straight through trying to, you know, the team revamping the website, working like crazy to get stuff done and then go straight into the next academic year without, without some respite. So for me, this metaphor of third gear, do we absolutely have to do that? And do we absolutely have to do that now? as a question to my own team, I found to be quite helpful and powerful. And we can recognize there's stuff we'd really like to do, but we're not going to try and do all of it at once because we won't get to the end of the year if we do that. So, so from my perspective, the metaphor of third gear has been something very powerful. Um, but panelists, I'm curious to hear what your takeaway little nugget would be. Cully, I don't doubt you have one. You're sitting there looking wise. So I'm going to come to you first. I'm not sure about that, Sinead, but I've definitely um, got one that, I, that I'd like to go for. Um, often we worry about where our starting points are with well-being. We think about what do we start with? How do you tackle it? What we find is it often becomes subjective because the well-being officer thinks, I think I'll tackle this. So staff surveys are important, but why are we not opening the channels up? And let's get staff suggestions open. This allows everybody from all from all um, levels, so to speak, of, of, of job role. It allows them to contribute. They can leave their name if they want to. The staff suggestion stays open. It's in SharePoint. And then weekly, we feed back saying, this is what was suggested, and this is what we're now doing about it. And sometimes some suggestions, I, I understand, can't be actioned straight away. But the very fact that staff have a, have a channel that's open um, throughout, and the fact that they're being listened to, gives a sense of empowerment and it's not false empowerment, it's real empowerment because there are some things that can be a quick win. 
And if we're talking about staff well-being and we're talking about everybody being in this together, and that's at all levels, that's certainly something that I'd advise schools, leaders, whoever it is to do, because you get a real uh, temperature for the climate that way. It shouldn't be, shouldn't feel threat threatening. It should be open. Leave it anonymous because you don't really need to know who's contributed. But if they want to leave their name, absolutely fantastic too. And then do, do feedback on what's been suggested and what we've done about it across the academy. So what we've done about it's so powerful, Cully, isn't it? When you go back to people and, and you respond. Too many times we do these things and don't let staff know where that's all gone. Um, Becky, what would your practical advice be, whether it's to, to, you know, to people from their organisational role perspective or to individuals? What would you offer? I think from my own experience, um, both professionally and personally, I think it's about communication as Collie said and it is about being there to listen and also being honest with yourself as well it's not a weakness to admit that you need help support or advice thank you becky very powerfully put nikki from your point of view what is what would you say as a piece of practical advice people can take away what would you offer i go with the, another version of your third gear i think Sinead, which is um, in psychology we have a uh concept which is good enough it's used about attachment theory really and I think especially in a school environment boy it's good enough you know it's almost a dirty word isn't it it's got to be better excellent that push that marginal gain come on move it forward actually no it's good enough it's good enough stop there it's good enough stop give yourself a break step away do something else don't get lost in something else and um and I think it's really helpful to realise that those words are positive. It's good enough. I love that. Good enough is good enough is brilliant. Actually, we're in a pandemic. Good enough <laughs> is fantastic. Very positive. Thank you, Nikki. Um, Bupinda, what would you be? What would be your practical takeaway? Have a break. It's to have ten minutes away from your desk away from your computer away from the classroom and just really go and sit somewhere else sit in the staff room sit outside go for a walk do something get away from your desk from your passion from your workload for at least 10 15 minutes in the school day if you can and i know it's hard and i don't you know i can't talk for everyone but here the workload you know we've got a good balance um, and it's really important to continue having that balance throughout your teaching career. Uh, you just don't want to burn yourself out. So yeah, definitely look into like, having a 10, 15 minute of work every single day. Put yourself first. Thank you. And Hilary, the last word on this to you. Ooh, okay. Yeah. Just following off on what Pinder said, um, just get outside, connect with nature, look up, look up in the sky. We're always looking at our computers, our phones, moving on to the next thing the next thing get outside i know it's hard to do get some fresh air kick the autumn leaves look at a rainbow it, it's so important and as we're moving you know as we go through technology is taking over everything um go back to nature which it's really helped me on a personal note whether you're a teacher or whatever your job role is um you know not in education at all i would say just get back connecting with nature get some fresh air and look at a rainbow <laughs> and that's not a flippant thing just you know connect with nature again it's really really good to be your, for your well-being i love that um the i realize as you said it i have not been out in the autumn leaves at all so there's my half term homework um Thank you all very much. I just want to remind everybody on the call of our website where you can find resources, but also really importantly, that 08000 number. That helpline number is available 24 seven for anyone working in any education setting. And you, you don't have to be in crisis. You know, for many of us, we've been cheek by jowl with our loved ones. We're still not going out so much. You don't always want to turn to somebody in your own domestic setting and, and share something that's troubling you. You might just feel like that's a bit much. On the end of this phone are people who are qualified and trained and well able to have a conversation. And it's a resource that is there for the whole of the education workforce. So, so please use it. 
uh, if it can be of any use to you at all. I really hope you take a break over this coming half term and switch off the email for whatever period of time you can. Don't You don't need to feel anxious about it, but you, there will be periods of time you can switch it off for. In particular, a shout out to our middle leaders. I think that you um, carry the nation on your shoulders. We do, of course, want to attend to everybody in all the roles in our schools, but our middle leaders have been unsung through a lot of this. And for you in particular, I hope that there is a break in, in this half term that's coming. Um, and finally, just to say a huge thank you to AT&T. We, AT&T? <laughs> Isn't AT&T an actual something else? Anyway, ATT. Um, for partnering with us on this and for promoting this work and for focusing on well-being as much as you do. It's a real pleasure uh, to be working with you on this. So thank you all, everybody. Uh, I wish you a fantastic rest of your Thursday. And look, you've got three minutes of your life back as well. Thanks a million for coming. Thank you, panelists. You're fab. <laughs>